John, welcome to the Bitcoin Source. Can we start things off by having you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah. Hey, Daru. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. My name is John Light. Uh, I do research about Bitcoin and blockchain, cryptocurrency, smart contracts, kind of all different aspects of like Bitcoin technology. And um, my day job is working as a product manager for a Bitcoin project called Sovereign. Nice, nice. Thank you for that introduction, John. Um, the first question um, I want to ask you is a question that I usually ask every guest that comes on the show, just because I'm a, I'm a nerd at heart. And the first question is, you know, what inspired you to source your Bitcoin knowledge when you first became a Bitcoiner way, way back, whether it was books, courses, or even people in the ecosystem? So could you kind of give some details on, you know, your journey? Yeah, sure. It was a long and, and winding journey. I, I think the very start of the journey probably begins um, when I first heard about a guy who was running for president in the 2008 presidential campaign named Ron Paul. Uh, he was a congressman from Texas, and he had a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, he was he was anti-war. He uh, believed in the legalization of all drugs. Um, he b believed in a small government and sound money and, um, you know, fiscal constraint, individual liberty. He, he was into a lot of, uh, the same kind of ideas, um, and had a lot of the same philosophical beliefs that I did. And that struck me as very unique, um, about a politician. I had never heard a politician speak like he had, he did, um, but I I started looking into uh, him some more and like watching his uh, talks that he gave and, and reading uh, some of the things that he wrote. And um, he made references to uh, economists such as um, Ludwig von Mises or uh, Friedrich Hayek. And I started reading um, books um, by those uh, economists. Um, Ludwig von Mises' uh, theory of money and credit and uh, Friedrich Hayek's um, denationalization of money were particularly influential with regards to what would eventually become my, my understanding of Bitcoin. And um, through um, learning about um, Ron Paul's political philosophy, libertarianism, I became interested in other topics like anarchism and agorism. And um, that led me to a podcast um, called Cypherpunked um, because it was, it was on a podcast um, network called uh, Agorist Radio. And uh, on the Cypherpunked podcast, um, one of the guests like, st uh, was talking about Bitcoin. And uh, it, their description of it um, was very interesting to me. Uh, it was like nothing that I had ever heard of before. Uh, I, the, you know, decentralized digital currency um, was, was very interesting to me. And so I started looking up other sources online about Bitcoin. Um, I found the Bitcoin wiki. Um, I think nowadays it's at wiki.bitcoin.it or, or something like that. Um, and started just clicking through articles on the Bitcoin wiki to learn more about Bitcoin. Um, you know, the very basics of Bitcoin down to like the lower level, like what are the nuts and bolts? Like how, how does it all fit together? How does it really work? And I like gradually convinced myself like this is real. This is, this is working. And it has the potential to continue working and to continue scaling and to actually be a replacement for uh, fiat money or, you know, government issued uh, currency. And uh, when I, when I realized this, uh, I decided like, you know, money is one of the most important institutions or, or, or tools that we have as, as humans. And it's, it's, it's very important that, money be um decentralized and and uh, supportive of people's um freedom and um so i see it as a main pillar of society and so so i decided like you know i want to do whatever i can to try to make bitcoin um 
widely adopted and and to see it grow to its its full potential and and i've been on that journey um ever since um these days um i'm less focused on the economics of it because it's just you know it's a it's a part of my basic understanding i don't think the economics of bitcoin are going to change very much uh, if ever um at least with regards to the monetary policy um and and so i'm more focused on like the technical aspect of bitcoin now um like how can we how can we scale bitcoin to the world so that um people use bitcoin uh, um for, for as many different types of transactions where they need to use some kind of money um as possible like i want bitcoin to be like the go to solution um when people think like i i need to spend money or i need money for this transaction I want people to think like they can use Bitcoin and, and like Bitcoin is valuable and 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 good for those transactions. So I look at ways um, that we can scale Bitcoin to support many more users. I look at ways that we can make Bitcoin more private so that people um, who are concerned about privacy um, choose to use Bitcoin. Um, I, I look at ways that we can make Bitcoin more expressive um, so that people can have um, many different ways to uh, store and transfer Bitcoin um, that are consistent with their uh, security requirements or, or other kinds of contractual obligations that they might have. Um, and, 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 and those are kind of the, the different aspects of, of Bitcoin that I'm interested in, in kind of pushing forward on um, nowadays. And I get my information about these things uh, from a lot of different topics within the Bitcoin ecosystem um, there's like the Bitcoin dev mailing list where a lot of people post interesting ideas. Um, there are Bitcoin researchers um, in like private researchers as well as in uh, academia who publish papers. Um, and so I, I, I just look out for papers um, that people are publishing on interesting topics. Um, I'll, I'll watch videos from like conferences academic conferences or industry conferences where people are presenting um, new protocols or different kinds of proposals, um, like the Financial Crypto Conference, or um, this is an older series, but like the Scaling Bitcoin conferences had a lot of really great content. Um, and I, I also look into the like altcoin ecosystem um, because there's a lot of um, really great researchers and engineers in the altcoin ecosystems who have been doing a lot of interesting um, research into you know all of those topics that I mentioned um, about Bitcoin that I'm interested in, and uh, because they're not constrained in the same ways that Bitcoin is, uh, in terms of uh, both like the capabilities of their protocols as well as like their ability to put those their ideas into production. Um, we're actually able to like see how these things like work in practice um, in these you know altcoin uh, blockchains, um, and so I think it's I think it's interesting to like look at those systems uh, and and see how they're running and see how they're working and see like you know are those actually good ideas? Like should we maybe consider bringing those ideas back into Bitcoin? Um, so. Yeah, those are kind of the main uh, ways that I'm uh, getting information about Bitcoin uh, nowadays. Um, just following other researchers that are working on problems that that I'm interested in, and and having you know, reviewing their research, having those conversations, and um, uh, publishing things myself occasionally, and and getting feedback from people, um, which sometimes introduces me to new ideas so you know there's so much to unpack there john but um a couple things a couple things that you said that uh resonated with me which was um when you said that the economics is no longer a part of your you know bitcoin journey because you just understand the properties of the protocol i just think that that's ingenious i think a lot of i've never heard anybody really have that take on bitcoin before and one other thing I really wanted to ask you too, you know, what inspired you to get into open source projects, right? So it's like, you know, Bitcoin has a ton of them. And like, what was really important to you about open source projects that kind of inspired you to get started in that realm? So for me, it's about um, security and freedom. So open source software um, 
like at the foundational level of like how it's licensed and how the source code is shared with uh, the public and like end users. Um, it, it, it means that people have the freedom to inspect the code and like know how the software that is actually running on their computer works. They can look in the code and they can see like there's no back doors. There's no, uh, there's no, you know, hidden third party, like spying on like what you're doing. Um, and so I think it's really important from a privacy and security perspective for open, uh, for software to be open source. And then from a freedom perspective of being able to take the software that you have and actually modify it and, and, and improve it or adapt it to like your own unique individual needs. I think that freedom is really important because, um, you know, everybody has unique individual needs and like why should why should people have to like wait for some third party gatekeeper to like maybe decide that their needs are important in order for a software to you know have a new feature or have some issue fixed people should just be able to if they have the capability to take the source code fix it or add the feature whatever and then run it and then their problem is solved like i think that's a very empowering uh, capability and it's a it's a really important property i think to preserve in uh software um i also think it you know it, it expands beyond software i like this philosophy i would apply to any kind of aspect of like our 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 <laughs> the built world that we live in you know like i think open hardware is also really important um there's this movement called like right to repair where you know people sh uh, there's actually like there's actually a legal debate do people have the right to fix the products that they buy like this is a debate to me it shouldn't be a debate it's it should just be a no-brainer you buy something it's yours you have a right to to tinker with it and fix it if something's broken but actually um today there are legal precedents that prevent people from actually being able to fix their own uh, property if something is broken, and and so yeah, that that's really what um, what it boils down to for me is 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 freedom, privacy, security, and just transparency. Knowing how this, how this software that you're using actually works, so you can be sure that it works the way that you want it to. And those ideas come from the open source movement, the free software movement. Um, there are a lot of uh, great thinkers um, going back to the 70s and 80s who have been preaching about these ideas. I would encourage people to, who you know haven't really dug into it to just look up those terms like open source software movement, free software movement, and and read a, read about it and and learn about it and. Um, Hopefully, you know, the ideas resonate and, uh, and and you begin to apply that uh, lens of thinking to the software that you run. Yeah. And, you know, don't quote me on this, but I want to say Steve Jobs had a quote where he said, um, you know, if you build great software, you must build great hardware. And just thinking about that, what you just said there, John, about. Um, how there's precedent there where people can't open up their iPhone and actually repair it on their own or, you know, even a miner, like there's mining technicians out there that actually repair the ASIC miners, but I'm sure that they don't really allow publicly for people to just go in and start tinkering with their product. And I think that that open source hardware movement that you're involved in is very important because I think for Bitcoin to scale at a large uh, mass, I think that um, those are things that have to come into play. When you look at the hardware systems in Bitcoin right now, a lot of it is based around um, cold wallets and things of that nature where, you know, most people are not opening up their ledger to see what's inside or their treasure or their cold card. So I think that those are things that are important, especially when you start looking at the security aspects and the privacy aspects of Bitcoin. But what I really want to get into now, John, is like what you do on your day to day. So the company that you work for, I really want you to kind of expound on really what goes on there. So the first question is, what is sovereign? That's where you work or where you work on, you know, the protocol. And can you explain the layer 
to Bitcoin sidechain that they use there, which is called RSK? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So Sovereign isn't a company per se. Um, I actually just have my own company and I'm self-employed. Um, but Sovereign is a, a, a project or an open protocol um, that a lot of different people uh, around the world work on. Um, and um, the idea of Sovereign is to build a world on Bitcoin. And we're starting with financial technology um, because we see Bitcoin as like the very solid monetary foundation on which the economy, the decentralized economy of the future that we want to see um, is being built. And, and so the next kind of layer up from that, the monetary layer is the, the financial layer where people can do more sophisticated kinds of uh, financial transactions with their money to be able to use their money to um, buy things, to be able to use their money to... Um, finance a business or, uh, you know, a personal loan or a mortgage or something like that to be able to do peer to peer trades for other kinds of digital assets. Um, it's, it's, it's about building, you know, taking the building blocks of the financial system, decentralizing them and making Bitcoin, you know, the, the first class money of this new a decentralized financial system. Um, and that's what we're focused on um, right now. Um, but, you know, the vision of sovereign goes beyond that to, to, to enable people to be sovereign in, in uh, all different aspects of their life. We're just starting with money and finance um, because Bitcoin is such a powerful um, tool in those areas. And um, the, the blockchain that the sovereign protocol is built on is as you mentioned, it's called RSK. Uh, RSK is short for rootstock. Um, the community, uh, for the most part, uh, calls it the rootstock blockchain these days. Um, and um, rootstock is a, a separate blockchain from Bitcoin. It is EVM compatible, meaning that um, you can deploy any smart contract that would run on Ethereum or any other blockchain that uses the Ethereum virtual virtual machine or the EVM, uh, you can deploy those same contracts to rootstock with very little effort. You just like change some configuration details um, and you should just be able to deploy it directly to the blockchain and, and start interacting with that smart contract. Um, what's special about rootstock compared to other EVM blockchains is that the native asset of rootstock that users um, will use to pay uh, gas or, or transaction fees. So Rootstock has uh, a bridge uh, from the Bitcoin main chain to the Rootstock blockchain that people can use to lock up their Bitcoin on the main chain and then receive an equivalent amount of Bitcoin on the Rootstock blockchain and then on the Rootstock blockchain, you know, transfer it around to other addresses or interact with different smart contracts and pay their mining fees uh, with Bitcoin. Um, and so you can you can think of it like you know just any other EVM chain, but it's like Bitcoin native. And so we the the protocols that Sovereign has built uh, on the Rootstock blockchain include um, peer to peer trading protocols. Uh, uh, spot trading as well as margin trading, um, peer to peer lending and borrowing, so people can lend and, and borrow uh, asset, assets uh, directly with each other. And um, we're, we're also, uh, we also have a decentralized stablecoin protocol um, where we have a stablecoin called ZUSD that is. Uh, over uh, collateralized with Bitcoin. And the basic way that that works is that people can put up their Bitcoin as collateral into a smart contract, and then they can borrow up to 90% of the USD value of their Bitcoin as the USD stable coins that are issued by the protocol on demand. So, you know, let's say you have $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, you put it in this smart contract, 
you can borrow up to you know, nine, $900 worth of ZUSD. And when you, when you borrow those funds for yourself, the ZUSD are minted like on demand. Like they just, the, the smart contract just creates the 900 ZUSD and then gives it to you. And then you can use those 900 ZUSD out in the economy. You can spend it, you can trade it, you can do what uh, do whatever you want with it or whatever you can with it, whatever the economy is able to support. Um, and then once, whenever you want your Bitcoin back, you can just, you know, go get some ZUSD and uh, take it back to the smart contract, pay off your loan and get your Bitcoin collateral back. Um, and, you know, importantly, the ZUSD, it has value as a stable coin because it's always backed by at least uh, one ZUSD is, all, is, is designed to be backed by at least one dollar and 10 cents worth of Bitcoin. Um, and I think right now it's closer to like about two dollars uh, worth of Bitcoin for every one ZUSD that's in circulation because people don't borrow at, you know, the maximum like collateral ratio. They they keep their collateral ratios much higher so that they can um, be safe from liquidations. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, those are some of the projects uh, that we're working on in Sovereign. And, um, and, and, and that's a little bit about, you know, what, what we're doing with Rootstock. Nice, nice. I mean, there's so many things I want to ask now. Like, <laughs> you know, my audience is a really Bitcoin heavy focused audience. And, you know, just you mentioning some of these things. I mean, there's some things that I didn't like about the protocol because I wanted you to kind of explain it and elucidate what Sovereign does because I was like reading on it a little bit. And then from my understanding, it looked like well, why is the company doing what they're doing when you have the Lightning Network or you have a layer two or three application that's kind of doing the same thing? But then I start looking, digging deeper into it. And just from my technical background and aptitude, it's looking like it's more of something called a wrapped smart contract where um, you put something in, it gets wrapped and then you can convert it into something else. There's some, I don't want to say issues with that for me, but I would say my qualm with it is that why is it being run on an EVM blockchain? My assumption is, is that it's easier to scale. It's, it's just easier for engineers to go in and edit and modify things instead of trying to, you know, get approval on the main, you know, Bitcoin main chain or something for that example. So you can answer that question in a second, John. But mm -hmm. um, I think I think a lot of people that watch this podcast, um, they're so terrified of being burnt. When you talk about bridges, bridges get, you know, they get exploited all the time by hackers. Um, I don't know how your security protocol is there with, you, with your team, but when I heard the word bridge, I was like a wrap smart contract and it's on a bridge. I'm like, oh my goodness, like I need him to explain this more because <laughs> a lot of people are going to be all over this episode because they're like, oh, he's, he's talking about altcoins. He's talking about EVM blockchain. So if you can kind of give me a little bit more clarity on like the security end of that, I'd love to know it. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the the we'll start with the bridge because the bridge is definitely like the the thing that makes everything else about Rootstock and and how you can use Bitcoin in Rootstock smart contracts work. Um, so the bridge that uh, Rootstock uses is called a pow peg, is like the the technical name that they gave to this bridge. And the way that the PowPeg works is that they have a federation of 12 different nodes run by different companies or individuals, organizations, whatever, in the uh, Rootstock ecosystem. These different uh, entities uh, run a node called a PowHSM node. That stands for Proof of Work Hardware Security Module, and this uh, hard, this PAL HSM is designed to be kind of like an autonomous hardware wallet, in that it it has private keys that are stored inside of the hardware, and the hardware is designed so that you cannot extract the private keys, even if you have like physical access to the hardware. Um, 
And the way that it works like autonomously is that unlike a hardware wallet where, you know, it receives transactions and you can press buttons and sign transactions in order to move coins around, there's no buttons on this hardware that let you just sign arbitrary transactions. Instead, it's programmed to only sign transactions under certain conditions. And the specific conditions that this hardware is looking for in order to sign a transaction is, was there a withdrawal transaction confirmed on the Rootstock blockchain and then buried under a certain amount of proof of work? And is the transaction that I'm signing sending Bitcoin on the main chain to the Bitcoin address that was specified in the withdrawal transaction that got confirmed on the Rootstock blockchain. So putting it all together, you've got this federation of 12 different nodes who are each running this hardware that has this rule kind of burnt into it. And then the, that federation forms a multi-sig, a seven of 12 multi-sig on the main Bitcoin blockchain. And so when users want to transfer their Bitcoin to the Rootstock blockchain over the PowPeg bridge, they send their Bitcoin to the PowPeg Federation multi-sig address. And then the Rootstock blockchain, like the full nodes on the Rootstock uh, blockchain network, are looking at the main Bitcoin blockchain and they see, okay, somebody just sent some Bitcoin to the Rootstock uh, PowPeg address. And when they did that, they specified in their Bitcoin transaction that they want to receive the Bitcoin on this Rootstock address. There's like a, a data field in the Bitcoin transaction called an op return where you can insert arbitrary data. And the user who's bridging in Bitcoin to the Rootstock blockchain is going to embed the rootstock address where they want to receive their rootstock bitcoin they, they they put the rootstock address directly in that bitcoin deposit transaction so they they send that bitcoin to the PowPeg address the rootstock nodes see that detect the deposit and then after a certain number of bitcoin confirmations uh they will autonomous like the protocol will just autonomously mint that amount of Bitcoin to that specified rootstock address. And then when the user wants to get their Bitcoin back out on the main chain, they're going to create a withdrawal transaction on the rootstock chain saying, you know, I want to withdraw this amount of Bitcoin to this Bitcoin main chain address. And they send that transaction to the bridge contract on rootstock. And it's basically going to burn the rootstock Bitcoin. And the PowPeg Federation with their Pow HSM nodes is going to detect that withdrawal transaction. And after a certain number of confirmations on the rootstock blockchain, the Pow HSM nodes are going to autonomously craft and uh, sign and broadcast a transaction spending from the multi-sig on the Bitcoin main chain and send the specified amount of Bitcoin to the specified Bitcoin main chain address. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you've created a system where no single party or even a few parties uh, in the it, that are participating in this multi-sig have the ability to to steal the Bitcoin that's held and backing all of the Bitcoin that's on the Rootstock blockchain. And because the POW HSMs are running autonomously, even the people who have the hardware, they couldn't force the hardware to you know sign transactions and send the Bitcoin to you know, somewhere that it's not supposed to go. Like, the only thing they can do is they could unplug the hardware and stop it from working. 
And in that case, the Bitcoin would be frozen, but it wouldn't be stolen. And there's a backup script in the multi-sig script that is actually holding the Bitcoins that says if the multi-sig stops working for a year, because let's say all of the hardware did get un unplugged or like there was a solar flare and it like burned uh, all of the hardware chips uh, or something like that, then the Bitcoin will be sent to a second multi-sig where you know there's an emergency like backup procedure that they can use to set up a new federation and uh, bring the Bitcoin back into the PowPeg once the PowPeg hardware is able to come back online. Um, and so the Rootstock Bridge has been um, in operation since 2018. Um, there's only been one uh, significant issue that I'm ever that I've uh, been aware of uh, in its history, um, and it actually just occurred um, in October due to um, a, an upgrade to the PowPeg script to work with Taproot, and um, it what happened was that the Bitcoin multi-sig transaction that was actually you know, allowing people to withdraw their Bitcoin back to the Bitcoin main chain was being considered non-standard by Bitcoin full node software. So the multi-sig transaction was actually valid under Bitcoin consensus rules, but because it was crafted a certain way that was, <clears throat> that was, uh, that was new, um, Bitcoin full nodes have uh, this feature that's called node policy, where they can define certain restrictions that are not part of the consensus rules. And this multi-sig script that was used by the PowPeg just happened to, I shouldn't say just happened, but like <laughs> it, it uh, without the developers intending it to, like it, it, uh, it, was classified as non-standard by Bitcoin full node software. And so what the Rootstock developers did is they um, upgraded the firmware on the PAL HSM devices so uh, to, to basically rewrite the script so that it still worked the same way as it did before in terms of, you know, it's a 7 of 12 multi-sig and it's looking for the withdrawal transactions buried under so much proof of work, et cetera. Um, but it was crafting the transactions in such a way that Bitcoin full nodes would consider the transactions to be standard and that no changes would be required to Bitcoin core in order for those transactions to be processed. Because those were basically the two options that they were faced with. Either we need to change the node policy, the, like the default node policy in Bitcoin core so that these transactions get relayed and miners will put them into blocks and uh, those transactions will get mined. Or we need to change the way how we're doing transactions so that they uh, will be considered you know, standard transactions under the current Bitcoin Core um, node policy. And they ended up going with the latter approach. Um, and now uh, Rootstock PowPeg withdrawals uh, have been re-enabled as of I think a week ago, um, and people can you know use the protocol as uh, as normal um, again. Um, it's important to note that like during that whole time, like the Bitcoin was safe; it was sitting there in the multi-sig. Um, it was just waiting for this software update so that the Bitcoin transactions would actually be propagated through the Bitcoin network and. Uh, confirmed in, in, in blocks. Um, but yeah, it's not risk-free, uh, you know, compared, compared to just holding Bitcoin on the Bitcoin main chain. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I, you know, anything except holding Bitcoin on the Bitcoin main chain is going to have different trade-offs. Even lightning has different trade-offs. Other protocols such as state chains, um, have trade-offs, um, 
and you know this new this this mechanism rootstock uh, palpeg it, it has its own like set of trade offs. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that people put like all of their Bitcoin into the palpeg, um, but uh, for putting a portion of your Bitcoin, you know, into this other system to get these benefits, you know, that risk reward trade off, uh, it might be worth it to people. Um, in the same way that you know, putting your Bitcoin into a Lightning channel um, and you know, using your Bitcoin in other kinds of experimental software, um, even like wallets, like there have been wallets just layer one, normal layer one Bitcoin wallets where people have lost money because of a bug or something. Um, and like, it, you know, I, I think, I think uh, it's just important to um, take that into consideration with all the software you're using, like consider the risk reward trade-off, consider diversifying, like don't put all your eggs in one basket, um, use a heterogeneous uh, storage uh, system so that you're not putting all of your trust and, and reliance on a single company or a single piece of software. Um, and that's the best way to keep your Bitcoin safe. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, explains a bit about like how, how it works. And I'd be happy to answer any like follow up questions you have. Thank you, John, for that. That was a for the folks out there like that was a huge technical <laughs> conversation right there. And I understood a lot of the things that John was saying, but I think a lot of people are just going to be completely flummoxed at what you were just talking about. Like, what is he talking about? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I, a lot of, a lot of Bitcoin stuff is like that. Right. I mean, like even just talking about like, how does a normal like Bitcoin address work? Like you start talking about like how you generate points on an ECDSA, you know, curve and, you know, like how public key cryptography works with public and private keys. And like, um, you know, once you start talking about lightning, you're like talking about like hash time lock contracts and stuff like that. Like the nuts and bolts of this stuff, like it's very interesting, but it, yeah, it's like, it's like very technical. And like, I think, you know, you can, you can either like put that out of your mind and just say like, I'm just going to try this and like, see if it works. I can see that other people are using it and it works. But like, I do think it's understand, it, it's good to like try and dig into it and like understand ac actually what you're doing. Because as you pointed out, there have been bridge that has, bridges that have been hacked. And in some cases, it was because the bridges were designed in a fundamentally flawed way. And like, if people had actually looked closely at how they were designed, they would have seen that. And, um, and so it, it is important to like, I think, do do a review, do your own research, like understand how the things that you're using are working um, and and come to your own conclusions, make the best decisions that you can. And like I said, I think most importantly, don't put all your eggs in one basket because um, this all, all, like this whole space is like very young, immature, experimental and um, and, and it, it's really easy to like make a mistake. Um, so just be safe, be careful, um, experiment, but like experiment, you know, with, with small amounts of money that like you can afford to lose. Uh, I think that applies to Bitcoin and like, you know, any, anything new and experimental like this in general, like, especially, you know, new kinds of stuff, like new experimental stuff that's getting built on top of new experimental stuff that's getting built on top of new experimental stuff, et cetera. Like it's, uh, we're all kind of, you know, just part of the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. And John, you know, I love that you kind of towards the end, let people know, like you have to do your own research. And the beauty, the beautiful thing about this podcast is like, there's pros and cons to everything. And this is really based around where people are sourcing their Bitcoin knowledge from. And I think that um, your technical skills in this arena of validity rollups, layer two solutions, you know, cross chain protocols, all these things are super important that people need to know about. And for the technical people in the room that are listening to this, um, I think that they'll get a lot of um, value out of it, even though I don't agree with a lot of the things you said, but it doesn't really matter what I think because it's up to people to make their own financial investment decisions. And when you're dealing with new technology, you have to take the risk of, you know, trying things. And I always subscribe to the method of, um, you know, 
keeping things simple. And if you keep things simple, there's less chances for things to break, but you also lose out on innovation. And I kind of want to play like devil's advocate here because I was um, traversing Twitter and I kind of seen like a post that Alex Gladstein kind of posed to, you know, the Bitcoin community. And I seen that you had a rebuttal for him. And I want to say that um, Alex Gladstein was pretty much asking like, what is the main driver of the interest in the NFT market for utility and why hasn't it taken off in Bitcoin? And I wanted to just kind of um, hear your response to the rebuttal that you gave him on Twitter, if you could remember what you said. Um, what I was trying to say was that the Bitcoin, like I think he referenced DeFi and NFT specifically. Um, and, and I think what I was saying was that um, in uh, particularly when it comes to Bitcoin based NFTs and DeFi, uh, I would say it's like early days. You know, I think his argument was basically even if we could do Bitcoin NFTs and DeFi, it's probably not going to be very big because in Bitcoin, we don't have these artificial incentives from tokens like other tokens that are being created to incentivize those activities like his argument is that because in altcoin ecosystems like ethereum and 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 other blockchains uh there are all of these you know communities that have their own tokens and then they will incentivize people to use DeFi protocols or to trade nfts or or buy nfts whatever by you know, giving them these tokens that are being issued like out of thin air. Um, and then, uh, so, so because there's this incentive, a lot of people swarm and they, they put money in these DeFi protocols so they can earn these incentives or they trade these NFTs so they can earn these subsidies. Um, and, and he's saying like, Bitcoin doesn't have that same kind of dynamic. Like you don't see a lot of uh, projects on Bitcoin kind of creating these tokens out of thin air and then using them to incentivize people to do things. And so if we eventually see these Bitcoin NFTs and DeFi protocols on Bitcoin, they're unlikely to experience the same kind of meteoric rise in total value locked um, and, and trading volumes and things like that, which we've seen in, in, in altcoin ecosystems because that artificial incentive through the token inflation doesn't exist. And my rebuttal was basically that I think those markets have the potential to be quite big, even without these artificial incentives. Like, I think that, and, and, and this is backed partially by just a hypothesis like an educate, you know, a, a guess or speculation. Um, but it's partially based on empirically looking at um, the market as it exists uh, for Bitcoin based financial products. Like, for example, BlockFi. Now, I know people have their issues with BlockFi for BlockFi's own reasons, um, but like before it collapsed, everyone not everyone but like their customers thought it was gravy right um and 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 they had their bitcoin in blockfi and they were borrowing money against their bitcoin as collateral um without any kind of like artificial incentive like blockfi wasn't paying them to do that in fact the co the customers were were paying interest uh to blockfi to to borrow money uh using their bitcoin as collateral that's a very basic like DeFi kind of transaction, like put up Bitcoin as coll collateral, get a loan. It's one of the things that we do at Sovereign. Um, but, uh, and, and BlockFi had like billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin that was, that was doing this. And other um, Bitcoin backed lenders um, also had like tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And they weren't, like paying their customers to do it, the customers were actually paying money to get these loans. Um, and, and so I think that using your Bitcoin as collateral to get a loan is like a very fundamental, basic financial primitive that 
if the Bitcoin economy itself continues to grow, like Bitcoin adoption continues to grow, the price of Bitcoin continues to grow, like lots of people are going to want to access the liquidity of their Bitcoin without actually having to sell it and pay, you know, capital gains taxes, miss out on the upside if Bitcoin continues to increase in value. And so what they're going to want to do is to borrow against their Bitcoin and, you know, maintain a healthy margin so that they don't get liquidated. But, um, you know, the Bitcoin is sitting there and, you know, as they earn fiat income from their job or whatever, they can pay off their loan little by little. Or as the price of Bitcoin increases, once the price of Bitcoin increases so much, they can just use a portion of the increase to pay off their loan. And then they keep all of the rest as like profit. And like, this is like a very, I think, basic financial primitive that will continue to grow in usage, um, even, you know, without like artificial token incentives and things like that. Now, Bitcoin NFTs, I don't know. Like, I mean, I think, you know, the collectibles markets are very fussy. Uh, you know, things come and go in terms of what's like in, like, like what's in, uh, in favor and, 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 and what's trendy and what's not, um, you know, will NFTs continue to be a significant part of the collectibles market? I have no idea. Like maybe it's a fad, maybe it is something that persists in the same way that, you know, baseball cards and other kinds of collectibles persist, um, Maybe it's truly like a new medium for art in the same way that, you know, glass or metal or, you know, computer graphics or any, any other kind of new medium of art that has been invented um, persists throughout history. Like, I have no idea. Um, but, you know, I do think that, like, if, if it is like a medium that is here to stay for digital collectibles, digital art, uh, game items, and things like that, um, then I do think that, you know, as the Bitcoin economy grows, again, that market will continue to grow. Um, and it might not grow as fast without the token incentives, but I do think that, you know, it will grow uh, in maybe in proportion with the rest of the economy. And... Um, and, but you know that's that's more speculative. Like I I really don't know. I'm not I'm not big into art collecting or 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 other kinds of collectibles. So I I don't have a close pulse on that market. But um, my argument was just that because the Bitcoin economy I think is going to continue to grow, I think we can expect subsets of the Bitcoin economy, such as uh, Bitcoin finance and you know collectibles that are minted on Bitcoin to also grow. And Bitcoin finance in particular, I think, is is going to be huge um, because Bitcoin is money and finance is in intricately linked with money. And so it just seems like a no brainer to me that like if the Bitcoin economy is really big, the Bitcoin financial system is also going to be really big. Thank you, John, for that response. Um, you know, hopefully I can get Gladstein on the show to kind of, you know, break down his thought process of that. But on the upside of things, because I felt like, you know, during this conversation, there's been like a lot of controversy and we've been really talking about some really, you know, high level technical things that are just, you know, really experimental. And a lot of people don't, you know, humanity is based on just, you know, sticking to the script and people don't like to, you know, go outside of their comfort zones. And I think this conversation is going <laughs> to pull a lot of Bitcoiners in that way. But, um, on the upside of things, John, that I want to ask you, and this is the last question, um, I really want to talk about validity rollups and, you know, its solution for Bitcoin mining or possible solutions for Bitcoin mining. So my question is, um, do those validity rollups create more throughput and cheaper fees for Bitcoin miners? And what do you think their future potential benefit will be for that down the road? I, I think it's important to maybe set the context for the listeners of like what a validity rollup is. So earlier we were talking about like bridges, right? And and how you know different bridges have been hacked. And I was explaining how the root sock how peg bridge works. And like it's obvious that even though like the root sock how peg bridge is relatively solid in terms of like its design and 
certainly compared to other bridges that exist today. There are like obviously you can think of ways that like that bridge could break. Like if all of those POW HSM nodes just got unplugged, you know, we talked about how, you know, there's an emergency backup system, but now you have to worry about like how does that emergency backup system work? And, you know, it, it's it's like it's not it's not trustless. It's it's just it's yeah. it's not. It's 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 a federated trust model. Um uh, but it's not it's not trustless. Uh, validity rollups, uh, a validity rollup protocol is the way to have a trustless bridge between uh, a parent blockchain, in this case it would be Bitcoin, and another blockchain, which would be the rollup chain. And so it, the, the, the rollup protocol, the validity rollup protocol, provides a secure cryptographic way to transfer Bitcoin from the Bitcoin main chain to this other blockchain, and then to whenever you want to be able to bring your Bitcoin back from this other blockchain to the main Bitcoin blockchain without any trusted third party, without any federation, or or you know any any kind of entity in the middle that could censor that transaction or or steal the coins while they're held in the in the roll up contract. And I, I think that's a very powerful primitive that we can have because it means that we can build new blockchains that have new features that people invent, maybe new privacy protocols, new scaling protocols, without having to actually change the main Bitcoin blockchain. All we need is to be able to support validity rollups on Bitcoin layer one. And then we can... For any new feature that we could think of, we can build it as a, a, a roll-up chain that's built on Bitcoin, and people can trustlessly move their Bitcoin into this new chain to take advantage of of, of that new feature. Um, and and you know, there's no need for any further changes on Bitcoin Layer One. I think that's a very powerful concept. Now, to your question about scaling, um, you know, there are protocols that people have developed for validity rollups that are able to compress transactions down to the size of just a few bytes, like 12 to 15 bytes per transaction. That's compared to your you know, current like Bitcoin transaction today. When you create a transaction, it might be somewhere between like two to five or 600 bytes. Uh, there are bigger transactions. Um, but like if you're just doing a simple spend from you know, one Bitcoin address to another, it's probably in that, you know, area of like 200 to, to, to 500 um, bytes for the transaction. And so you're, sh you're shrinking that down to like 12 bytes. And that's, you know, um, uh, like, like a 50 X improvement in space efficiency in terms of, you know, how many transactions that you could fit into a Bitcoin block. Um, and, and, and that's huge, right? I mean, it, it means that we could go from like the 2,000 transactions that we see in a block today to like 100,000. And um, depending on how you design the, the rollup, it could go up to as much as like two or 300,000 uh, transactions per Bitcoin block, which would be over 100 times more transactions uh, per block than we see in the average Bitcoin block today. Um, and, you know, if all of those transactions are paying uh, the same fee rate that they're paying for transactions today, then that would mean, you know, about 100 times more revenue for Bitcoin miners, which I'm sure miners would be, be very happy about. Um, and so this, I think, is important for maintaining the hash rate um, and, 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 you know, keeping Bitcoin secure against like 51% attacks. Um, it's, it's important to be for, you know, being able to support like high value Bitcoin transactions so pe people can make uh, high value transactions um, without, without worrying about being double spent. Um, and, uh, you know, like, like miners, they have businesses, you know, they want to make money. Like, I think that's, 
they would be pretty happy to make like a hundred times more fee revenue than they do today. Um, I'm not saying like that's a guaranteed outcome, but I'm saying that because, you know, it enables so many more transactions per block, that is like a possible uh, scenario. You could also see a scenario where the fee revenue per transaction drops. So like the cost per transaction drops. Uh, if it drops by 99%, then you end up with the same revenue that you have today. But if it's any, if it's any, if it's anything less than a 99% drop, then the miners are still making more money than they were before. Um, and if the cost of a transaction goes up because of induced demand, uh, which is an economics term where you lower the cost of something and the demand to acquire it or use it goes up. Um, if the if the cost if the if the cost per transaction ends up going up because of induced demand, then the miners could earn even more than a hundred times more fee revenue. So you know there are, there are a bunch of different scenarios, um, but I think uh, you know for the purposes of like uh, yeah miners considerations, I think the scaling aspect is one interesting um, thing to consider. Another interesting thing to consider is what I was talking about with like new features. So like, it, you know, if we if we had a blockchain that had some desirable new feature, like maybe a new secure self custody protocol, or a new privacy protocol, um, that you know made Bitcoin more attractive uh, to use on chain um, for individuals or enterprise or institutions, um, you know, that could result in more. Bitcoin transactions happening, which will, you know, over time, like push up the um, fee rate that people are paying for transactions um, because there's more competition to get into a block. Um, so I, I think these are really interesting um, capabilities that rollups unlock to, um, you know, potentially add more scalability and more utility to Bitcoin, which will result in more value, or you know, it results in the potential uh, for more value uh, going to Bitcoin miners. Yes, yes. You know, I could talk about this stuff all day long. It's just this was a really, really, really insightful, highly technical uh, Bitcoin conversation, and I really appreciate you, John, for really breaking down some of these difficult concepts that a lot of people are curious about and want to learn more about. But before we go, can you give out your social media handles and any future endeavors that you might want the world to know about before we close out this episode? Yeah, sure. So um, you can find uh, my blog where I publish opinions and research about Bitcoin and other, you know, topics I'm interested in, like peer to peer technology, privacy, security, that kind of stuff um, on my website at uh, lightco.in. That's L-I-G-H-T-C-O dot I-N. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, where I'm, where I'm fairly active, um, blogging, uh, micro blogging about, you know, basically the same kind of stuff. Um, uh, but on a more frequent basis, uh, twitter.com slash Litecoin, L I G H T C O I N at Litecoin. Once again, John, thank you very much for taking time to be on a Bitcoin source. Have a good one. Yeah. Thanks again, Daru.